there. May I take your order, please? Yes, you may. The Golden Arches has dominated American culture for many decades now. And, of course, there's been surprises along the way. Here are ten times McDonald's made our jaws drop. The McRib was first developed by the U.S. Army. And I'd like the McRib to be available year-round! In 1981, the same year that McDonald's gave the world the Chicken McNugget, the franchise unleashed another boneless wonder, the McRib Sandwich, made of reconstituted pork parts fashioned in the shape of a small rack of ribs. But the original product was not designed in-house, but by the U.S. military's Combat Capabilities Development Command Soldier Center in Natick, Massachusetts. A military scientist was tasked with finding a way to deliver protein-rich food, namely meat, to soldiers via meal kits, and pork was decided on as a cheaper alternative to beef and having more nutrients than chicken. Because the government, and therefore the military, doesn't put patents or copyrights on anything it develops, the National Pork Producers Council invested the money to try and make the product viable on a wider commercial scale. This got McDonald's interested. She might leave and never come back. Just like the McRib! McD's executive chef, Rene Arend, the inventor of the Chicken McNugget, was tasked with coming up with a pork sandwich. And the rest is history, literally. Because unlike the Chicken McNugget, the McRib sandwich had a much less successful rollout. While initially successful in the Midwest, by 1985, sales had declined so much that executives removed it from the menu. The McRib made a comeback in 1994 as a promotional item for the live action movie version of The Flintstones and remained on the menu at many restaurants for another decade. In 2005, it was decided to put the McRib on a farewell tour, which was so successful they did another goodbye in 2006 and in 2007. But after that, there have only been a dozen or so times when the sandwich has temporarily returned. So if you're a fan of the McRib, keep your eyes open for its next eventual return. They've been preparing for the robot future. Yeah, we're gonna kick it up a notch. Bam! In his 2001 book, Fast Food Nation, Eric Schlosser estimated that nearly one in eight American citizens had been employed at one point by McDonald's. But the truth is, the company has been trying to shed flesh and blood employees for a long time now. Even in the late 90s, when the internet was more of a trend, the company began experimenting with ordering at electronic kiosks inside restaurants, instead of talking to a 17-year-old at the counter. It's so easy to order on your phone nowadays and then pick up a prepared bag of food at the restaurant that you sometimes forget that the only human involved in making the meal is wrapping the burger and placing it in the bag. Considering the fact that 70% of sales in the United States comes via the drive through window, it's no surprise that in the last few years, more and more often, the voice on the other end of the loudspeaker is not even a real person, <laughs> but a very simple AI program that cheerfully takes your order and quickly quickly repeats it to make sure it's correct. McDee's almost partnered with NASA. My name is Peter and I work at the brewer NASA. The McDonald's marketing team never sleeps because they know that if you aren't always telling people how great the experience at their restaurant is, they're liable to forget and keep scrolling through their newsfeed. One of the zanier promotion attempts happened in the mid-1990s when McDonald's found out that NASA was planning to send a spacecraft to a nearby asteroid, which just happened to have the name, wait for it, 449 Hamburga. It was discovered in 1899 by German astronomers and named after the city of Hamburg. But McDonald's wasn't going to let this Golden Arches opportunity go to waste. It won't go to waste. There were some serious discussions between the fast food giant and NASA because it was seen as a win-win, where a bit of money from McDonald's to help fund the mission would get a lot of publicity for the space agency, which would be helpful for what is really just a rather mundane trip to a big rock. In the end, the project was canceled because McDonald's didn't want to pony up for the actual price tag, which is a bit of a shame. Just picture a silly commercial of Ronald planting a Golden Arches flag on the rock and saying, it's one small step for a clown. Their burgers are actually 100% beef. The hottest, juiciest quarter pounder yet, made with 100% fresh beef. 
The quality of McDonald's burgers has had a checkered history. In the 1960s, the idea of going to one of their restaurants anywhere in the country and having a burger of identical quality served to you immediately was a welcome novelty. But over the years, there was competition from other fast food franchises and from upscale restaurants that were willing to tackle the old barbecue standard, upping everyone's expectation for what a good burger should be. This is a tasty burger. Perhaps it's inevitable that when a company is around for so long and is so successful that people ultimately look for problems with it, both accurate and not. For a long time, the rumor was that to combat the perception that their burgers were less than, McDonald's began assuring the public of their commitment to quality and taste by printing 100% beef on the wrappers of products like Quarter Pounders and Big Macs. The rumor was that 100% beef was the name of a shell company run by McDonald's, which meant it wasn't a statement of fact but a logo. While not at all true, so many people believed the story that it forced the company to put out several press releases and invite journalists to their production facilities to prove that, yes, their burgers are actually made with 100% actual beef. What is Grimace supposed to be? Here comes Grimace. You got some burgers I can steal, huh? The inhabitants of McDonald Land all seem quite sensible in a setting meant to invoke a fast food restaurant theme. There's Mayor McCheese, the Fry Kids, as well as the Hamburglar, whose name gives him no choice in the matter of his profession. While Ronald himself might be the only odd one out as a half-human, half-clown, there's also the big purple thing. Grimace is a vaguely triangular biped with arms and a face, but in terms of description, that's about it. He doesn't talk much about himself, and none of the other characters ever seem to bring up the topic of what he actually is. I don't know. We don't talk about him much. In the early 70s, Grimace was an evil character in league with the Hamburglar to illicitly get his hands on the fast food goods. Only recently did a McDonald's executive spill the fries and reveal that Grimace is meant to be a giant taste bud, meaning he's supposed to suggest that McDonald's food tastes good. It's a bit of a head scratcher, but looking at him with this new info, I guess it makes sense. Ronald McDonald has a hotly debated origin story. God, this is worse than having Ronald McDonald for a father. It's no contest who the most famous clown in the world is. It's Ronald McDonald by a country mile, but it was a bit of a rocky road to get where we are today. The original character was indeed a clown, but he wore a paper cup on his nose and a cardboard box on his head. He was created by Willard Scott, known at the time as a radio DJ who also played Bozo the Clown on local television. Scott claims he came up with the name and the idea of how to portray Ronald in commercials, but McDonald's doesn't mention anything about Scott's involvement except that he played the character briefly in the mid-60s. And that could have been the end of it, except for the fact that Scott didn't disappear off the face of the earth, but instead became a well-known TV weatherman man for the Today Show for over three decades. I've known I wanted to be a clown since I found out clowns were just people with makeup. In interviews and memoirs, he reiterates his position that Ronald would be nothing without him, and he even made a point of starring in a commercial for Burger King in 1992. While the design of Ronald was changed not long after Scott's tenure to the happy red-haired clown we all recognize today, it should be mentioned that the illustration in the 1967 and copyright patent is pure nightmare fuel. The Chicken McNugget changed U.S. farming. What type of food is a McNugget? Some type of a... Uh... Paella? The Chicken McNugget, the tiny little treat that comes in packs of 4, 6, 10, and 20, is such a mainstay for contemporary customers that it's hard to believe that McDonald's existed for decades without them. In the eternal mealtime struggle of chicken versus bone, McDonald's first executive chef, René Arend, created the recipe in 1979 using boneless, reconstituted pieces of chicken, which were battered and deep-fried. 
While the head honchos at McD's hoped the slow rollout in 1981 at certain locations would do decent business, they were completely unprepared for its ultimate success. Not only were the initial restaurants clamoring for more, but almost every other franchise across the country wanted to get in on the action. We pay for it. We want it all. McDonald's very quickly became the largest purchaser of chicken in the United States, but it still took two years to build the facilities to debone and grind the meat, and then fashion it into the four specific McNugget shapes. Even when all the facilities were set up, the chicken farmers of America were not prepared for this demand. And for a period of time in the 80s, there was a national chicken shortage and price spikes thanks to these nuggets. And it wasn't a fad, with many customers, especially kids, bailing on hamburgers completely. So it's no surprise that the McNuggets are still going strong. In fact, sales jumped 10% in 2017 when the company removed our artificial preservatives used in their preparation. McDonald's made a video game. You know what's boring? Sitting there playing that mind-numbing game. By the 1980s, surveys showed that kids would recognize the golden arches of McDonald's before various religious symbols. Marketing to adults was obviously helpful, but broadcasting commercials during blocks of children's programming definitely ensured that parents would get a steady influx of begging and pleading for Happy Meals. In the early 90s, the company was so successful that they just asked, why not have kids play our commercials? Enter Make Kids, a 1992 2D side-scrolling video game for the Nintendo Entertainment System. It looked and played a lot like Super Mario Bros. 3, which, hey, if you're going to rip off a video game, you may as well choose one of the very best. Learn from the best. You play as Mick or Mac, and because eating McDonald's can be done together, a two-player mode means you and a friend can play together at the same time and go on a journey through McDonald land to find Ronald's magic bag that the Hamburglar stole by collecting puzzle cards and giving them to familiar McDonald land faces like Grimace and Birdie. The graphics are fine for its time, the controls are quite good, and there's just enough variety in the level design to prevent you from getting bored. International McDonald's changed the game. Wow, this restaurant is so international. As the movie The Founder showed, Ray Kroc was not going to lose his chance to squeeze every dollar he could out of hungry customers. So why stop at the border? It wasn't long before McDonald's was expanding and opening restaurants across the world. And while, of course, they brought the burger and fry mainstays that satisfied U.S. citizens, executives knew that appealing to particular regional tastes had its own financial advantages. Due to religious beliefs against eating beef and pork in India, it seems like the company would be facing an uphill battle. But a billion potential customers were waiting, so there are both chicken and vegetarian-based patties for the Big Macs, and in addition to fries, rice bowls are popular sides. It should come as no surprise that different countries have different dipping sauces that range from fiery to sour cream-like. Where's the dipping sauce? And in some cases, it's amazing that American restaurants haven't brought some of these unique menu items over, like the Tamago Double Mac, which adds pepper sauce and a poached egg inside your traditional Big Mac. McD's didn't know their Monopoly game was crooked. You don't go by Monopoly, man. That game is nuts. Since 1987, McDonald's has had a promotion where customers can win prizes by collecting stickers that come on various product wrappers and cups that mirror the traditional Monopoly board game. Unbeknownst to the company and the public at large, the firm overseeing the distribution of stickers had a security problem. The head of the department was Jerry Jacobson, and he began hoarding the winning game pieces, which included prizes for cash, cars, and vacations in the late 90s. He would would give them to friends and family to redeem and then get a cut for helping set it up. At one point, he got members of organized crime involved to help cover his tracks. But foolishly, he went by the name Uncle Jerry, so it wasn't hard to put the pieces together, and he was eventually caught. These kids are going to jail. Jacobson ultimately spent three years in prison, and while plenty of lawsuits were thrown about involving McDonald's and the other companies involved over who was ultimately responsible, 
responsible. Apparently, the public didn't think it was too big of a deal because the Monopoly promotion was back within a few years. Why stop now? Check out another great Babbletop video. Thanks!